most organizations we run into would be this culture scan. Compete laterally, trying to get promotions. If I help you, I don't help me, right? I'll help you to a degree, but if it's a, you know, if, if I don't get the promotion because I helped you, right, that's kind of self-defeating. So they're very much compete laterally and they're control vertically. And as agilists, we come into organizations and we've got a lot of morality around this. Like, this is awful. This is unreasonable. I can't believe they do this, right? So sometimes we have this morality that we come in with. And the reality is, it's actually a very logical, rational system to have that control. Because if an organization, as you've heard today, if an organization isn't trustworthy, if the system of deliver can't be, delivery can't be trusted, to say what it's going to do and do it and do it, and do it in a way that's safe in terms of all of the concerns of the organization, it's a very valid organizational design. It would be silly to, to delegate into a system that isn't trustworthy, right? It would be folly to do that, right? It would be dangerous to do that. So what we find is many, most organizations that we come into early on, are, they're explicitly perfectly designed for control. It's not accidental. Um, they have groups of people who've been hired to do jobs to tell other people ostensibly what they can and can't do. And to put those controls in place because the system underneath is unpredictable. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know what it's going to do. It could expose us to, you know, to, to large losses, large risks. Um, you know, in some cases, you know, uh, customers could die, right, as we talked about. In super large organizations, you'll tend to see these things called Office of the CIO or the Business Office. That's where all of those controls want to be built and they want to live. So we'll actually create uh, teams and people and, you know, so there's roles in many cases, hundreds and th or thousands even of people whose job it is to figure out how everybody else can and can't work. And the reason is because there's no safety in that organization. So we have to involve those organizations when we change, when we come in and do we do transformation. A lot of times we'll come in as, as, as people who are doing transformation, we might hire into a corporate role, we might come in as a consultancy. We want to focus on the teams. It's a great place to focus. But we bypass all of those other things. We don't pay attention to them right away. We treat them like they're an annoyance or in, in some cases like, like they're actually evil because they don't let us do what we want to do the way we want to do it. That's their job. They didn't make up their jobs. They didn't go out and create their own job descriptions. They didn't go hire. They didn't, you know, they, they were put in that job for a reason and entrusted with something because the organization cared about it. The other place you'll see it is, uh, is from other parts of the, of the company. So other horizontals like HR, um, you know, very, very common issue we have uh, when we're trying to just stabilize teams is co-employment. So there's co-employment concerns. If we treat contractors like employees, we could be on the hook for taxes, for all of their employment taxes. Um, and effectively, the IRS could make us write a big check and people can sue us. And so it's a big concern. It's a valid concern. We don't like it. We wish it would go away, right? But it's there. So there are other parts of the company or these organizations who have concerns. They have needs. They're valid concerns. Uh, finance. Finance has to report to the street in many cases. If, you, if you're a public company, finance has to report to the street. There's rules on that. There's auditors. There's all kinds of tax law. There's, there's big dogs attached to these tails that we can't just ignore. But often we do. We just go right to the teams and we try to do this agile stuff and we struggle because the rest of the organization isn't designed to do it. So, so what we've been noticing, um, especially with these large scale transformations that we're doing, as we push the organization further and further, as we help them achieve higher and higher levels of business agility, we introduce these tensions, we need exceptions, and there are opportunities to change. So we create tension with the organizational design. It's not designed to work this way. We need exceptions to go, and there are opportunities to actually make meaningful change, not just to the, to the products and the teams, but the organizational design itself at strategic kind of inflection points in the transformation. 
So this journey is, is you know, basically um, when we talk about aligning systems and capabilities to markets and customers, if all I did was trustworthy systems, and this is the way we're learning this, right? We show up, we get a bunch of teams to, you know, doing agile, we're doing, uh, you know, uh, some teams, backlogs, working tested product, all of that's good, but is the organization really aligned to its customers and its markets? No, right? Um, so then, you know, uh, we start to, to look at, okay, so what kind of work's coming into the system? How are we making decisions in the system? How are we delegating into that system? How are we organizing that system? So you need elements of this full journey, but both of these things have to change together. So your finance systems at whether I'm gonna change my capitalization, whether I'm gonna move to OKRs, you know, all of those things have to like happen in concert with the journey of the mass of your organization. One of the biggest epiphanies I had um, with a large customer we have is when we started, I created a, I helped them to create a transformation office. And it was a super valuable, still is a super valuable thing. Um, what I didn't do uh, was to actually, to, to spend enough time to, to really get into the business office and figure out what are they doing? And what, what kind of came into my head, what I kind of learned about that was later on, the, the regret I had was that transformation office is the transformed business office. I didn't realize that. It hit me too late. What I should have been doing was starting with the functions in the business office and figuring out how to make them end up be the transformation office. So um, the business office might have been focused on leadership, you know, objectives around, you know, um, delivery, telling teams what to do. The transformation office promotes leadership in terms of how are you working on the system? How are you making it better? How are you, you know, you're not, you don't get to tell teams to do what to do anymore. So that role of leadership has shifted. So I think one of the biggest things that, you know, on that, if I had to do over, would be um, to engage the business office early on and to figure out and to model them. They're really just another portfolio of capability. Their capability is, you know, career and professional development. It's training. It's it's hiring. It's, you know, outsourcing. It's all the things that a business office does. Um, even outside of IT and HR, like understanding when and where those things needed to come along and foster and support the transformation and themselves be transformed. And what we would have ended up with, I think, is a smoother transition because um, what we did end up with was some duplicate capability, some fighting, right? So we had the old and the new trying to do the, you know, trying to solve the same problems different ways. One was a high trust way, one was kind of the old way, and creates tension, right? So those tensions I talked about, I didn't relieve them by actually moving the organizational design. I created a new parallel organization design, and it fights with the old <laughs> organizational design. So I think maybe one of the biggest epiphanies I had, and so, you know, if there's one thing you're going to take away, the everybody else, don't bypass your business office. Don't bypass HR. Don't buy. Don't. There's a there's a time and a place for all of it. There's a there's an order in which this stuff has to be true. Can I? Does it make sense to do OKRs if I don't have a trustworthy system and product empowered product owners? Probably not going to work, right? I can do a lot of work. I'm not going to get the result. Should I realign my organizational structure to value streams if I haven't broken my dependencies and I don't have a way to delegate into that system? Probably going to struggle. Right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's an order in which this stuff needs to be true, but engage directly. Um, and, you know, as you're doing it, like I, I'm just really cognizant of of you know being respectful of the fact these people serve an important function. They're important people, um, just they have to do things a different way. Right? So when, you know, with with gentleness and respect, um, engage them, 
and help them to then understand what they look like as a product-driven organization. What products do you have as HR? What products do you have as procurement? And how can we form teams around that? And how can we govern that? And how can we just look at you as another agile portfolio? And usually what I find when I do this is they're super appreciative of that. 